2013 began in similar fashion as the year it followed, as lawmakers dealt with the severe case of electile dysfunction in Washington. More than 500 days after a budgetary time bomb began ticking, congressional leaders diffused the dreaded fiscal cliff at the 11th hour of the previous session. In last-minute negotiations between Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Vice President Joe Biden, a combination of permanent middle-class tax cuts and fresh tax incentives on wealthy Americans sealed the deal. Other legislative wrangling had a major impact in rural America. After months of tedious work on the 2012 Farm Bill, House leaders acquiesced to a simple one-year extension of existing law. The extension, however, was a blow to farmers hoping for direction in U.S. agricultural policy. The Farm Bill, or lack thereof, proved to be a never-ending storyline for the 113th Congress, which endured one self-inflicted wound after another. The only thing moving slower than Congress last winter may have been the Mississippi River. Barge traffic slowed to a trickle 150 miles south of St. Louis, forcing the Army Corps of Engineers to remove rock pinnacles from the beleaguered waterway near Thebes, Illinois. I know that this is a matter of great interest and concern for all of us in the region. The Mississippi, of course, is America's primary waterway for grain exports. But a more controversial conduit also was in the news this year. The proposed Keystone XL pipeline would funnel crude oil thousands of miles from Canada and North Dakota to Gulf Coast refineries. Proponents say the project would enhance U.S. energy security and create more than 50,000 jobs. But critics claim the project is an environmental nightmare. While the full impact of the controversial proposal remains to be seen, the Obama administration remained firmly on the fence. In a review last spring, the State Department expressed no major objections, but stopped short of fully approving the controversial project. Despite the neutral response, those opposed to the project continued to express their concern. 830,000 barrels per day at 2% is 16,600 barrels per day leaking undetected in my water, on my property. Further west, the state of Colorado served as a microcosm of the rest of the country in the weather department. Initially, there was concern over dry conditions. There's snow in the mountains, but yet we've, we're, we're seeing flame at the same time, and it's just unheard of out here to see this this time of year. And I, I just hope this isn't the new norm, what we're going to be seeing every summer and every spring out here. It's kind of frightening. But change was in the wind, and after sequential years of drought, forecasters called for a shift in weather patterns in the Rockies and other parts of America. The overall picture is certainly better than we were this time last year, especially for the Midwest. We still have a lot of concerns from California to the Central and Southern Plains, however. Things appear to be changing in Washington, too. After months of partisan bickering, lawmakers agreed to an $85 billion package of spending cuts known as the sequester. And, as fate would have it, the cutbacks took effect just as the economy exhibited its most sustained improvement since the recession ended in 2009. Half of the $85 billion in reduced spending would come directly from the defense budget. The remaining amount was slated to come from discretionary programs like education, law enforcement, and through furloughs of federal employees. You know, Americans know that Washington has a spending problem. It's hurting families, it's hurting small businesses, and it must be addressed. For the most part, the sequester had a muted effect on rural America, largely because major cuts in agricultural spending appeared to be looming on the horizon in the Farm Bill. And with little direction from Washington, America's farmers set out to plant the largest number of acres to corn since 1936. But soil temperatures struggled to get much above the freezing point in the heart of the Corn Belt. And the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reported that April was the second coldest month since 1895. Timely rains delivered crucial moisture to most of the region, but with temperatures hovering more than 10 degrees below average, Mother Nature delayed planting for weeks 
and the Mississippi River escaped its banks in some areas. As the calendar advanced to May, Old Man Winter returned for an encore. Planters that in many years would have been halfway through their annual chore were idled under a blanket of snow that set records in several Midwestern states. Within weeks, though, triple-digit temperatures returned to the Grain Belt, while tornadoes roared across the southern plains. An EF-5 twister demolished Moore, Oklahoma, marking the town's fourth devastating touchdown since 1999. EF-4 tornadoes ravaged the area in 2003 and 2010, while another EF-5 racked up over $1 billion worth of damage nearly 15 years earlier. Back in Colorado, tinder dry brush fueled the largest outbreak of wildfires in the Rocky Mountain state's history. Fires in the Black Forest area alone charred 25 square miles. And memories of the Waldo Canyon blaze of 2012 prompted residents to take evacuation orders seriously. I think everybody's afraid after the fires last year. So um, I think people are um, getting out a little faster this year. Hit the top of the tree! By August, wildfires also were burning near Yosemite National Park and the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The Rim Fire blackened an area larger than Chicago, while other blazes ravaged portions of California and Arizona as late as December. And only months after being scorched by the wildfires, Colorado had a new meteorological malady, torrential rain. More than six inches fell in Boulder County over a 12-hour period as flash floods wiped out roads and damaged farms. Oh gosh, five times more water than I've ever seen here. Just weeks later, a rare autumn blizzard paralyzed parts of the High Plains. As much as four feet of snow fell in parts of South Dakota, leaving thousands without power and killing thousands of cattle. A lot of guys losing everything, cows, calves, you name it. Little federal aid was available to South Dakota ranchers because Washington was still wrestling with the five-year authorization of numerous federal programs better known as the Farm Bill. On this vote, the yeas are 64, the nays are 35. The 60 vote threshold having been achieved, the bill is passed. The Senate approved its version of the bill earlier in May, eliminating direct payments to farmers and cutting $4 billion from the program formerly known as food stamps. The yeas are 195, the nays are 234, the bill is not passed. But the House of Representatives had different ideas, and lawmakers rejected an amendment-riddled version in June. The yeas are 216, the nays are 208, the bill is passed. A month later, the two new bills passed the House, one for commodities and a separate measure for entitlements. House reductions in spending on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, amounted to $40 billion, 10 times the cuts approved by the Senate. There are 16 million men and women whose jobs rely on the strength of agriculture. A bipartisan conference committee convened in October, hoping to make concessions between the two versions of the Farm Bill, but compromise has proven to be elusive. Do you like green eggs and ham? The true cost of political gridlock, however, was evident earlier in October when lawmakers played a high-stakes game of brinkmanship that nearly forced the U.S. to default on its sovereign debt. The problem began when House Republicans tried to use fiscal deadlines to derail the Obama administration's three-year-old health care law. Hundreds of national parks and other federally operated agencies and facilities were shuttered. Some government publications, including key USDA reports that can move markets, were delayed and even canceled during the 16-day shutdown. But work continued in America's booming oil fields. In fact, the U.S. produced more crude in October than it imported for the first time in nearly two decades. And the trend is expected to continue. The Energy Department says U.S. crude oil could rise by 800,000 barrels per day through 2016, reaching 9.5 million barrels per day, just 1% below the all-time high 
set in 1970. The government expects gasoline prices to fall over the same period to just over $3 per gallon. The boom in domestic oil production, however, is not without opposition. Critics say advanced drilling techniques like hydraulic fracturing or fracking pose significant threats to the environment. Opponents also voiced their dismay with some forms of renewable energy in 2013. So much so that the Obama administration proposed reducing the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS, to 13.1 billion gallons. Since the biggest cuts are targeted for ethanol, some analysts expected corn prices to take a major hit. Prices were already down nearly 50% from record highs recorded in 2012 during the worst drought in 50 years. But corn futures prices remained above $4 per bushel despite proposed reductions in the RFS and the harvest of this year that's expected to be a record corn crop in the neighborhood of 14 billion bushels. Don't mess with the RFS. Nevertheless, plans to roll back the RFS drew impassioned responses from supporters of the biofuel industry. And in early December, virtually every player in the debate pleaded its case to the EPA. API has encouraged that for the first time, EPA has acknowledged that the blend wall is a dangerous reality that must be addressed to avoid negative impacts on America's fuel supply and to prevent harm to American consumers. The RFS was designed to drive investment in new technologies to drive innovation, to drive new market opportunities. It was not designed to be convenient for the oil companies. With the year rapidly drawing to a close, lawmakers scurried to wrap up business in Washington last week before heading home for the holidays. But a lengthy to-do list awaits their return in January. The unfinished business includes a languishing farm bill, tax and immigration reforms, and raising the debt ceiling before Uncle Sam maxes out his credit card again in February. With half of the session already in the books, the 113th Congress is on pace to be the least productive in history. And with a recent Gallup poll revealing an approval rating of just 9%, it's also the least popular. So it seems likely that Washington's case of electile dysfunction will continue in 2014. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager.